Thank you so much, Franco. This uh, morning we are finishing up our study through the book of Esther. I will not sound as cool as that, but we will move ahead. I've truly been thankful for um, this short season and going through uh, this book of Esther, although there are certainly difficulties in the book. It's been good for me and I hope uh, for you as well. The end of the book of Esther, specifically chapter 9, connects the events of the story with the holiday of Purim. It gives us a reason for both the origin of the holiday and for its annual celebration. In fact, uh, this section, this end section, the explanation of the Purim festival is most likely the reason the book of Esther became popular among uh, Jewish people, but also uh, likely why it was included in the canon of Scripture. If, if you're not aware of canonization, um, Esther is one of the books that is disputed as to whether it actually should be in the Bible or not. It has been disputed since the canonization of Scripture. Um, chapter 9 portrays scenes of violence and revenge on a massive scale. It describes uh, a massacre by the Jews of over 75,000 non-Jews. Uh, this is all to get you excited for the uh, text today, obviously. Um, there, are, there are parts that are certainly difficult here today, and yet there are also wonderful truths for us in the text. And so let's read it together and work through it together. We're going to be going from the beginning of chapter 9 all the way through the end of chapter 10. So go ahead and stand if you're able and follow along as I read. Now, in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshandatha and Dalphin and Aspatha and Paratha and Adalia and Eridatha and Parmashta and Erisai and Eridai and Veasatha the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king, and the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this, to this day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder." Now, the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness." Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the royal towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day of glad for gladness and feasting as a holiday and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. 
And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday." that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is, cast lots to crush and destroy them. And when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil... His evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the term Pur. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter, and of what they had faced in this matter, and of what had, been, and, and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them, that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at that time appointed, and at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants." The queen, then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai, the Jew, gave full written authority, confirming this second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus in words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed season as Mordecai, the Jew, and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fasts and their lamenting. The command of Queen Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. And they not, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that you have granted to us through the scriptures. We pray for your help in this time, Lord, as we, as we work through the end of this book of Esther, that you would be glorified through it. Not just now in these moments, but as we continue, as we seek to follow you, Lord. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, we have a long text, obviously, and so um, we're going to be taking this in chunks. But nine months have passed since chapter 8 ends. It's now the appointed time when Haman's and then Mordecai's edicts come to fruition. Verse 1 begins, now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over over them, the reverse occurred. The reverse occurred. There's a complete turnaround of events that takes place, and and a complete turnaround of fortunes here. The the supposed overpowered or the ones that we would have thought early in the book would have been the overpowered ones now become the overpowering. Verse 2 tells us that um, the Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And we know from the last verse of Esther chapter 8 that it says many of the peoples, and the peoples being the Persians, not the Jewish people, but the Persians from the country, declared themselves to be Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Now, it seems here in verse 2 that while many in Persia sided with the Jews and, in fact, uh, likely pretended to be Jewish, others 
were prepared to do harm. Fear of the Jews, it says, overcame all of the people. In verse 3, all the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and royal agents also helped the Jews. And notice this, their support for the Jews from the Persian officials, from all of them, it says. None of their enemies could stand against them, we learn, but every single government official stood with the Jewish people. I think that's significant. In verse 4, we, we see that Mordecai is not called the Jew or the Jewish man. He is later again, but, but here he's not called the Jew or a Jewish man, but rather the man, which is calling attention to his own personal status that is increasing in Persia, how he has grown among the people. You compare that with Exodus chapter 11, verse 3, that says, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man, Moses, was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So it's, so it's a picture for us of how great Mordecai is becoming in the land. In verses 5 and 6, the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. The Jews thwarted all of those who hated them, their enemies. Now, it's, it's, it's likely, it's most likely that 500 is a rounded number, right? It's, it's, it's not an accurate head count, but giving us uh, an idea of how many people were killed in the city by them. But it's, but it's a decisive victory. It continues in, in 7 through 10, listing the sons of Haman who are also killed. And with each death comes the final blow to Haman's pride. Remember, his sons are listed in his boasting about the great things in his life. Their deaths assure the reader that Haman's lineage is now ended forever. At the end of verse 10, it says that, that they didn't lay hands on their plunder. Now, remember, in the original edict from Haman, it permitted the enemies to take the plunder of the Jews after they had killed them. And likewise, the edict from Mordecai permitted the Jews to take plunder from their enemies which was common, taking spoil after a victory and was normal in ancient warfare. However, here and in verses 15 and 16, it's, it's repeated that the Jews did not take plunder. It continues in verses 11 and 12, that very day the number of those killed in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? It, it seems from these verses that the king is impressed by the figures that have been quoted to him, just, just from in the city, which is strange since they're Persians, and secondly, that there's been so much bloodshed within the city, that's a that's strange that he's responding that way, but he does. And then for a fourth time, he offers Esther anything that she wants. And so verses 13 through 15, Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. So the request is granted. We find out that Haman's sons, who can't be killed again, are, are then impaled just as their father was, which is another display of dishonor for Haman and his household. 
And then verses 16 through 19. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th day and rested on the 15th day, making that day a uh, that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the royal towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day of gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. Now, 16 and 17 are really one long sentence, and the purpose is uh, twofold, to, con- to continue the story of the battles, but then also to recount the celebration of Purim. And so, just to give a a quick, as we read through those verses, it it can be confusing, but what it's saying is, um, because there was an extended day of killing, there is two days of celebration. So, those that only killed on the first day, the 13th, celebrated on the 14th. Those that, that did killing on the 13th and 14th celebrated on the 15th, okay? So, that's that's what's happening there in the text. And before we, we get to discussing the Purim Festival, I want us to think about what has happened here in these first 16 verses. And I want to say first, as we consider verses 1 through 16, I believe there is a holy and gracious God who is the hero of this book, always, from cover to cover. I believe that He reigns over all of it, that each page is an arrow to the gospel and the goodness of our king. And I don't believe, therefore, that I need to clean up the stories in the book, in the scriptures, to make him look holy and glorious and good. He is those things. He proves himself in those ways. The gospel is the good news that Christ died for sinners. And part of that good news is that every single individual apart from the man Jesus Christ desperately needed and needs forgiveness and mercy and forbearance constantly. Because each one of us is absolutely bent on sin. And so, I feel like we should be responsible to ask hard questions with or without the answer that we want or with or without an answer at all. I've read commentaries and Bible notes that bend over backwards as it relates to this section of Scripture to say what what it doesn't say in the text. And if I'm honest, this section is difficult for me. We aren't told how much of the killing by the Jews was done in self-defense. In fact, not once does it say in this text that they were attacked, which was the first edict, that they would be attacked on the 13th day of Adar, but rather that they killed those who sought harm on them, they killed those who hated them, and they killed their enemies. That's That's what we're told. This chapter did not resonate well with readers, especially Christians and many Jews following its writing. Many were too uncomfortable with what they saw as heartless and bloodthirsty Jewish revenge. The fact that Esther 9, 2 says that the Jews did this to those who sought their harm did not lay their discomfort at rest. And if if I'm honest, I've struggled with it as well. I have questions about how all of the officials, all of the government officials sided with the Jews and that many of the Persians feared the Jews and pretended to be Jews of how it later says that all feared the Jews 
and how the king was impressed with the killing of the Persians by the Jews, a king who is wicked. And yet, in that kingdom, people still attacked the Jews? It's possible. I mean, it is absolutely possible. And maybe that's exactly what verse 2 is referring to, but we're not told clearly. But we should also ask, was it right for Esther to ask for another day to kill? I mean, the original edict only permitted the Persians to attack them on the 13th. And when Esther is given permission to ask whatever she wants, she asks to be able to kill them on the day that they're not permitted to attack them. Is that okay? Is that right? Or is it absolutely wrong? Again, some commentators will say, well, just look how determined she is. But that feels a lot like don't look behind the curtain kind of commentary. There's nothing bad in the Bible kind of commentary. We don't believe that. We don't believe that the Bible is made up of a bunch of perfect people that Jesus comes alongside of and teams up with. That's just not the truth of the gospel. The truth is, even as it pertains to asking for another day of massacres, the truth is the author of the book neither condemns nor vindicates Esther here. Which is the author's theme? And if I should meet the author in heaven, we will have quite a conversation. <laughs> but there's no condemnation, there's no vindicating and so we don't know for certain. Ahasuerus asked her what she wanted, and she wanted one more day of killing enemies. And so like many other aspects of the book of Esther, we cannot make a definitive call on her motive or her innocence or her guilt. Now on the positive side for the Jews here, three times, three times it says they did not plunder, which is a good thing. It's an upright thing. So there is good there. They were permitted to and they refused to. Now, why ask? Why ask these questions? Why, why not just put flipping veggie tails on of <laughs> Esther and say, we were fine with this two months ago. We were okay with Esther from the perspective of Veggie Tales two months ago. Why are we asking these questions? I think most importantly, we should ask to keep ourselves from making the wrong person or people the heroes. We should never, ever be surprised when God sovereignly rescues individuals, His chosen people, and then they go overboard in sin. Remember Noah after the flood? There are example after example of God's chosen individuals and peoples going overboard and sinning and doing what wasn't right after God rescues them. That is a theme throughout the scriptures. So we shouldn't be surprised by that because God is the hero always. And then one more thing that I want to say, especially in light of this section, of what I've just said about this section. Jewish people have been marginalized, ostracized, abused, enslaved, killed since the Old Testament. And still today, recent comments from celebrities about Jewish people that have been liked and that have been repeated. This is something that should be condemned as followers of Jesus. It shouldn't be liked. It shouldn't be followed. 
It shouldn't be laughed at. It shouldn't be nodded to. Any sin that was committed in this text or any other doesn't result in blaming a people group. They sinned because they are exactly like me. And they're exactly like you. Now, let's get to the happy part of the text. Verses 17 through 19, which sincerely is probably the best part of the book, or the rest of the text is. Verses 17 through 19 tell us about the beginning of the festival of Purim. The festival of Purim began as a spontaneous response from the Jewish community. In response to victory over their enemies, a day of rest was held that became a day of feasting and joy is what it tells us. Those who rested after the 13th celebrated on the 14th. Those who fought again on the 14th celebrated on the 15th. It was a celebration of the rest that they received. There was gladness and feasting and giving to others. It's a beautiful picture. That that, that expression, day of feasting, is literally a party day. I got more nods from party day than I did the entire rest of the sermon so far, okay? So I'm going to try to top that and see what happens. But verse 20, and Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far. So Mordecai records the events that have occurred and sends the record to Jews far and wide so that they will continue to celebrate and to remember the events each year, that it would just continue to happen. Verses, uh, verse 22 As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. The Jews did not commemorate the day of their victorious battle, but the day on which they rested from their enemies. Notice the language for the rest of this chapter. The Purim festival and all of the language surrounding it and the letter that goes out and everything, the Purim festival is stripped of military overtones and the idea of vengeance on enemies. Instead, it is more closely associated with the positive concepts of enjoying rest and expressing community, joy, and gratitude. In all of the language that goes out to the people, there is no mention of the Jews killing their enemies. It says the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. It's a beautiful Thing to remember. The morning of chapter 4 has turned into joy and celebration now. Verses 24 and 25, a summary of the story is given. And notice in those verses that in the summary, Esther and Mordecai play no part. Haman is the evil protagonist, and King Ahasuerus saves the day by giving written orders to secure the end of Haman's plans. And there's not mention of the Jewish military victory on the 13th and the 14th. Verse 26, therefore, they called these days Purim, after the term Pur. It's it's interesting that the name given to the festival has to do with Pur, which is casting lots that Haman did to choose the day when the Jews would be attacked. It's a reminder of how the day that was coincidentally chosen and brought such fear turned into a day of victory and brought such rest and joy. Verses 27 and 28, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year. 
that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation and every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Now, festivals serve to remind one generation of what they have seen and experienced, but they also perpetuate the memory of those for, uh, who were not there to see it firsthand who were not witnesses of deliverance. The festival of Purim is still celebrated in Jewish communities today. And the festival uh, celebrates deliverance that they experience. It provides religious framework for the interpretation of the events in the story. And so I want to read to you what takes place just briefly in the festival. The, the Purim festival has become a Purim season that begins with the Sabbath of shekels that occurs on the Sabbath before the beginning of the month of Adar. The readings on this Sabbath commend the giving of money. The Sabbath immediately before the 14th of Adar is called the Sabbath of remembrance when the history of the enmity between the Jews and the Malachites is recalled. On the 13th of Adar, the Jews fast as they remember the risk Esther took on behalf of her people. At the conclusion of the fast, the book of Esther is read out in its entirety, preceded by the pronouncement of three blessings that praise God for His miraculous deeds. On the morning of Purim, the Esther scroll is read again in the synagogue, but the mood is lighter. In fact, children dress up as the main characters in the story, and the carnival atmosphere is enhanced by the telling of jokes and the singing of songs. When Haman's name is mentioned, children make a loud noise using various homemade shakers. Two types of gifts are sent, food parcels to friends and family and charitable donations for the, for the poor. And towards the end of the day, Jewish families gather together for a relaxed meal. It is a wonderful and purposeful remembrance of what the Lord did. Let's look briefly at chapter 10 before we close. It seems by the end of the story, Ahasuerus' rule was even more secure. His power and honor have increased. And at the same time, in those last three verses, we see that normality has returned to the Persian Empire, which meant taxes. Also, Mordecai is growing in influence and power. His Jewishness is underscored here. He's beloved by his people and continues to work for their benefit. Now, how do we end this series? And specifically, how do we end these two chapters? What can we learn about God from this section of Esther? And, and again, first, I want to begin by asking a couple of questions for you to consider as we even look into ourselves. As you consider chapter 9, do you find yourself being a person who seeks revenge? Now, I know I asked this in light of how King Ahasuerus responded to Queen Vashti in chapter 1. We, we, we talked about it then, but it bears asking again. Do you find yourself seeking revenge? Is your response to circumstances to an offense, reasonable or over the top? Are you a person who seeks justice or who seeks harm, whether it's physical or emotional? And secondly, do you purposefully remember gospel themes and moments in your life? Are you purposeful to remember, to remember the gospel and to remember the things, the good things that the Lord has done? I mean, we cannot neglect the emphasis on remembering from these chapters. In the Old Testament, God's people were often instructed to raise an Ebenezer. We sang that earlier in, in, in the hymn that we sang, Come Thou Fount. Here I raise my Ebenezer. And, and maybe you're like, I don't know why we sing that every time. I, it has to do with Christmas or what in the world. But Ebenezer is, is what we, we, we see in the Old Testament when, when the Lord is telling people to, to raise a stone of remembrance. That's an Ebenezer. 
And, and often we see that they're instructed to raise an Ebenezer. And every time a child or grandchild would ask why a particular stone of remembering had been placed or why God's laws were so important, parents and grandparents had an opportunity to share the truth with them about God and what He had done. We ought to be a people who remember the goodness of God and the gospel of Jesus and rehearse it. I've tried to point out uh, shadows or displays of the gospel over and over as we've gone through this book because I want us to be people who remember, who look for and rehearse the gospel as we read and as we live. And so where do we see the gospel in the text today? The Jews in Esther's and Mordecai's day experienced rest and relief from their enemies in a particular instance, right? They, there's these two days of, of, of killing and then rest, and they're called to remember that rest. But that's, that's a rest and relief from their enemies in a particular instance. He came again. There was, there was more fighting in their lives. There's more difficulty in their lives. But, but we have Christ who provides rest and relief from our enemies forever. Christ brings eternal and true liberation. When we see these shadows of rest in the Bible, it's, a, it's an arrow for us where our hearts ought to say, that's not good enough. We need a liberation. We need a freedom that is eternal, and that's what Christ brings for us. What came after the Jews' rest and relief? Memorials and taxes. That's what we get in the text. But Christ is better than that. Christ brings eternal, everlasting freedom. This text is a shadow of deliverance. True deliverance comes God's way, not our way. And ultimately, true deliverance comes by the death of the hero, not the enemies. As you consider chapter 9, we don't really know the answer to how much of the killing was vengeance and how much was self-defense, but we know the gospel. We know the truth of the gospel. And we know God isn't this way in bringing salvation. Yes, in the end, his enemies will be conquered, but now is the time of salvation, a time where his enemies are invited to come and feast with him at his table, to delight in his loving reign over them. Jesus died for those who hate him. And we are called as followers of him to reflect that kind of love, to be those kind of image bearers to the world. And lastly, the book of Esther ends with Mordecai in place to mediate for the Jews. But there's someone now who is cooperating with the king with their interests at heart. And it's a reminder of us that we have a true and better mediator who will never die, who will remain there forever, always making intercession. He will always be there with our interests at heart. Jesus mediates for those who have, entrusted in, who have trusted in him always. We're going to move into a time where we take the Lord's Supper together, and as we consider the Lord's Supper, Purim is, is a reminder of the great reversal that the story of Esther tells us. And so is the, Lord, the Lord's Supper, a great reminder of the great reversal the gospel tells. John Frame writes this concerning the Lord's Supper. We eat only little bits of bread and drink little cups of wine or juice, for we know that our fellowship with Christ in this life cannot begin to compare with the glory that awaits us in Him. These little bits are what? The reminders. 
a very small feast of celebration and joy, reminding us of the rest we receive from our enemies because Christ died for us, his enemies. Let's pray, pray as we prepare our hearts to come and receive the bread and the cup, take it together. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the time that we've had in this book of Esther, Lord. And I pray, Father, for our hearts, that our hearts would lean into you, that our desire and our hope would be in you and in you alone, as you would be the only hero of our story, of our faith, that you would bless us as we seek to know the truth, to know you through it. Lord, as we have this time of remembrance, Lord, we thank you that you have given us a means of, of regularly remembering what you have done. That we remember your body broken for us and we remember your blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And so we pray for your help in this time that you would meet with us, that you'd be glorified through us as we proclaim your death until you come, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.